Today on Uncommon Knowledge, if you think your computer makes you feel stupid now, just wait. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Technology and the Future of Humankind. Computers that are much smarter than we are, robots capable of self-replication, virtual immortality. All of that may sound like science fiction, but it's exactly what reputable computer scientists are predicting. And not for the distant future, but for just a few decades from today. When our machines are smarter and more adaptable than we are ourselves, where will that leave us? Joining us today, two guests. Bill Joy is chief scientist and co-founder of Sun Microsystems. Ray Kurzweil is an award-winning inventor and author of the best-selling book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. A statement by a moderator, uh, the moderator of a panel at which you both spoke recently, I'm quoting him. Today's human research is drawing on emerging research in areas such as artificial life, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, virtual reality, and on and on and on, are striving perhaps unwittingly to render themselves obsolete, close quote. So let's establish right at the beginning, do you really believe, do you really wish to contend that in the course of this century, human beings will become in some sense obsolete? Bill. There may be an unwitting consequence. It's certainly not the direct intent of most of the people working in the field. But that doesn't strike you as an outlandish statement at all. There's enough credibility to it that we ought to uh, think about it. Ray? Without putting too fine a point on it, it depends on what you mean by human. I think You've human already got me concerned. <laughs> human beings will change. And we're in the early stages of already putting computers, certainly in our clothing, in our pockets. Some people have them in their brains. I have a deaf friend who has a cochlear implant uh, who's profoundly deaf. He's getting a new model now that has a thousand points of frequency, so he'll actually be able to hear music for the first time. There are people with Parkinson's disease that actually have these small corpus of biological neurons that are destroyed by that disease, replaced, the functionality of those cells replaced by a neural implant. Uh, there are dozens of different implants, primarily for people with profound disabilities and medical issues. But in the decades ahead, we'll be putting them uh, in our bodies and brains uh, for other reasons to enhance our normal functionality and we'll be able to do it without surgery. We'll introduce them by sending tiny little intelligent robots, which I call nanobots, in, nanobots. In, through we'll our bloodstream. But we'll be, we'll be changing, we'll be merging with our technology. But an important point is that the non-biological portion of our intelligence is growing exponentially. Our biological intelligence isn't growing. It's, it's, brains are brains. It's fixed and it's a pretty fixed architecture. It, it has a certain amount of plasticity, but we'll be able to expand our experiences and ultimately our intelligence through this intimate merger. So we'll change the nature of what it is to be human, but in the positive side of it is we can make ourselves more human. You published The Age of Spiritual Machines in 1999, predicting what you've just said. Bill, you wrote a 10,000-word article in Wired magazine that appeared in the year 2000 meditating on and expanding on some of Ray's predictions and saying that there's plenty in what's to come for humans to be worried about. Right. Your book became a big bestseller. Your article produced an enormous number of emails, letters, news reports, re a huge response to both of those. Were you surprised by the response that, those, that your book and your article received? Yeah, I was surprised by the, the length of the response in particular and the depth of the response. And um, I think it touched a chord in people that um, people realize that things are happening that um, are challenging our ethical standards. There's many things that we can do, imagine doing, people propose to do that we find troubling in some way, and um, also exciting at the same time. It's Ray Kurzweil's book sparked the outcry that we've been discussing, so let's take a closer look at his argument. Ray, your book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, rests on a quite specific premise. 
uh, you call it the uh, law of accelerating returns. Now, a lot of people are familiar with Moore's law, which holds, I'll let you state it. Well, Moore's law is a specific paradigm for improving computational power. We're shrinking transistors by 50% every two years. We can put twice as many on a chip. They run twice as fast. It's a quadrupling of computer power. The law of accelerating returns broadened that, first of all, in terms of computers, that Moore's law was just one way of improving computational right. power. The next paradigm will be going into the third dimension. But moreover, this type of exponential growth is a function of all information-based technology. Now, that's an arresting point to me, because I, as a layman, had understood that everybody was expecting, perhaps sometime in this decade, that Moore's law would begin to bump up against physical well, limits. The, Once you etch circuits a molecule or an atom apart, you can, just can't cram any more in. But you're the, saying, no, we'll transcend it somehow. That's the key point. I mean, each paradigm comes to an end. They were shrinking vacuum tubes. They couldn't make them any smaller and keep the vacuum. Well, then a whole different approach came, transistors, which are not just small vacuum tubes. And we will get to the point where the key features are few atoms in width. We won't be able to shrink transistors on an integrated circuit. But integrated circuits are flat. We live in right. a three-dimensional world. We might as well use a third dimension. Our brains are organized in three dimensions. OK, you write, I'm quoting from your book, it is now 2009. A $1,000 computer can per perform about a trillion calculations per second. It is now 2019. A $1,000 computing device is now approximately equal to the computational ability of the human brain. It is now 2029. I'm continuing to quote you. A $1,000 unit of computation has the computing capacity of approximately 1,000 human brains. There is a growing discussion about the legal rights of computers. Machines claim to be conscious, and these claims are largely accepted. Close quote. Is consciousness merely a product or artifact of computational ability? Well, not, not at all. Uh, the power of the computer to match the computational ability of the brain is the hardware side. There's also the software side, understanding the methods of operation. Otherwise, we'll just have very fast computation of our spreadsheets. Uh, the primary source of that is understanding how the human brain works. And there's a grand project underway, which we've made more progress on than people realize, of reverse engineering, understanding the principles of operation of the human brain. And there's many different approaches to that. We're modeling the hundreds of different types of neurons with very detailed mathematical models. We're actually scanning the human brain to seeing the wiring of the interconnections. And there's actually been a couple dozen of the several hundred regions of the brain that have been reverse engineered in some detail and re-implemented. So we're under, there's other sources of the software of intelligence as well, just our experimentation and artificial intelligence. But one major source is going to be understanding what goes on in the human brain and then being able so to replicate here, that. Here's what I find provocative about the book and what I'd like to press you on a little bit. The notion here, you say machines will claim to be conscious and these claims will be accepted. And so the question I have is, do you draw any, is there any sharp or distinct line between humans? Is there something distinctively human about us that machines can never have? Or, well, or is that all a blur, a continuum? Well, I didn't really answer that question. Uh, I think it's a deeply philosophical issue as to what is consciousness. We accept that each other are conscious. Uh, but it becomes controversial when we go outside of human experience. There's a controversy about animals, and we will have a controversy about machines. But my point is you could, I mean, 28 years from now, you could have someone on your program, and they'll have a visual appearance, and they'll be, convince you that they're human. At least they'll seem that way. But some philosophers will say, no, they're not squirting you know, human neurotransmitters, or, and therefore uh, they, can't, they can't be conscious. I don't think there really is a scientific test, a machine you could slide an entity in and a green light will go on saying, yeah. this is consciousness that, that doesn't have some philosophical assumptions. Let me Trying to define consciousness and humanity itself, talk about challenging philosophical questions. Where do Bill and Ray stand on those? Pope John Paul II, I want to read this and see what you guys think of it. If the human body takes its origin from pre-existent living matter, the spiritual soul is immediately created by God. Consequently, theories which consider the mind as emerging from the forces of matter or as a mere epiphenomenon of matter are incompatible with the truth about man. So there you have a stark philosophical statement that there is a spiritual component which is separate from the mere matter. Do you buy it? Does that strike you as persuasive? Well, I see a strong spirituality in my children that I don't think I have impressed on them. I think it arises naturally. And certainly, you know, our spirituality can come from our his historicity, you know. And um, I uh, would note that machines are unlikely to be much like us, intelligent machines. 
Um, they're not likely even, to have even in the year 2029, even, well, even far out, relatively far out. Well, they're not likely to have uh, a sexual nature. I mean, they can reproduce asexually or in some other way. Um, I'm not clear that they necessarily have an individual mind. Uh, there's no reason they can't share things well, like a, with a land, and I also think that they can also share experience in a kind of Lamar what you'd call Lamarckian, uh, as opposed to sort of a Darwinian way. So the Lamarck, natural you, hold on, you've got to explain that for this layman. Well, you you normally don't expect that things that you learn in your lifetime will be passed to your children the way gene transmission works. It, right. you, you transmit. You know, there's this indirect way of evol evolution through selection, but not a not a pa not a sharing or passing of experience or There's acquired, or acquired to traits. Learn for themselves, as we say about our kids, right? Right. So culture is a mechanism of transmission, but not you don't you don't essentially directly pass experience. Um, so if you know French, your, your your son or daughter still has to learn it uh, directly, but that wouldn't be true of machines. So I think machines, the the natural life form. In a, in, a, in a robotic or machine substrate is likely to be, you know, more different from us than ants or wasps are different from us. And so I think it's a bit rom rom romanticizing. If we could actually create the computational power to create a race of intelligent or a species of intelligent machines, it's, I, I don't think we would be, the, we're not the natural life form. Our, our, our uh, emotional, spiritual, sexual individual nature is not the natural life form in that in that environment and so we wouldn't necessarily survive there for long even if we could be transplanted He's into that space. He's making me feel better. Your book creates a tremendous anxiety on the part of the reader for some clear line which as you've said you don't draw well, between us and them, between so, the machines and us. I mean the question comes up will these future machines be very human-like or will they be very alien and the answer is both. I mean, we will have alien forms of intelligence that are not at all human because they don't need to be. But we will also have machines that are very much human-like, if, no, if for no other reason than to communicate with us humans, because we like to communicate in a human-like way, and we will have machines that act human. And moreover, we will be en enhancing our own biological intelligence through intimate connection with, with right. machine intelligence. I, th I see that actually as a primary application. We'll be able to, for example, uh, shut down our signals coming from our real senses, replace them with the signals coming from a virtual environment. And if the prospect of intelligent machines is several decades into our future, the technology that will create them will also bring us other more immediate concerns. You write that the NBC weapons, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, that proved a cause of so much concern during the 20th century, will be largely displaced in the 21st by the GNR technologies, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics as a matter of concern. I'm not saying that the nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons aren't going to be a continuing concern. In fact, we see concern today. Sure. But biological, what I'm talking about is um, things that occur in the natural world and things that are made with non-information-based techniques. Right. So like the Russian bioweapons program largely would just take a disease and hit, it with, and hit it with, they'd hit it with an antibiotic or grow it in an antibiotic and try to find an antibiotic resistant version of it. With genetics, you can do things um, with, with a much deeper understanding of uh, what's going on. You have, you have the gene sequence, you can use some information model of how the genes work, of what the genes do and start cutting and pasting uh, things together. And this has been used uh, quite uh, successfully to do a number of amazing things already. Uh, so that whole field of genetic and engineering and the related sciences are, are going to bring us enormous benefits. Uh, there's many genetically based diseases we hope to come up with cures for, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, nanotechnology is basically nano is you know, a billion. That's basically anything done at kind of the atomic scale. But you can think of what the human body has is it has machinery for taking information at this kind of atomic scale and for manufacturing things using, using the ribosome. I mean, it has, it, has a, it has a molecular machinery for making certain, certain things at that scale. Now, it doesn't make them out of an arbitrary uh, set of elements. It makes them out of uh, or organic building blocks. Right. What nanotechnology really is, is, a simple way to think about it, is, is you use the entire periodic table, and you can manufacture anything at that scale, not just a particular subset of things that the, the, the uh, biological world uh, tends to manufacture. And then the robotics is what we've been talking about. These three fields would only, can only exist be, with information technology. We understand that there are all kinds of good things that can come from these technologies, but that piece that you wrote in Wired was a kind of warning. It was an alarm system. 
uh, going off, and what is it that you want to warn against? Well, the, the, the difficulty is that these three fields, because the designs are basically information, so a genetic design for a modified smallpox would be more like a computer file. It's not a vial containing some substance. And it's just, it can just be information that you could then put back uh, into physical form using some machine. And so uh, you can view that that information is then as dangerous as the physical substance. But our society, we haven't figured out how to collectively control information. And so we see uh, biologists putting uh, the gene sequence of pathogens up on the web. But those are as equally as dangerous as the, as the, as the vials of the material that we would, we would so, worry about containing. So 10 or 15 years from now, a Saddam Hussein with, a, what, with what would then be a standard <clears throat> sort of PC could do a lot of damage. I certainly, there are some people today that can probably do such damage. Well, it, it's still the case that the a lot of the machinery to, to do this and the knowledge of how to do this is, is relatively limited, and not everybody in the world right. knows this, but it's the, the knowledge and the ability to do this is also expanding at a very rapid pace. So far here at this table, we've talked about what a bad human being could do right. with some of these information technologies, but there's a lot in your article about what the information technologies could begin to do, so to speak, on their own. Am I reading that correctly, or is this just a layman's free-floating well, anxiety? Well, Bill was right. talking about that all these technologies are self-replicating. Right. Uh, certainly pathogens, whether they're viruses, bacteria, or cancer cells, do their damage by self-replication. And the same specter exists in the nanotechnology field, where you could have non-biological cancers, for example. Uh, the question is what to do about it. And the dilemma is that the, the technologies that are beneficial are the same ones that are harmful. I think that's the problem. Because otherwise you could say, well, let's keep the good things and let's just relinquish the bad. All right, I'm convinced of the dangers of these technologies, but what should be done about it? You've got a lot of people lathered up by your notion of relinquishment. Right. Can you explain what you meant by that? Well, what I said more precisely is we should relinquish the stuff that we considered too dangerous. Okay, and, and that and, 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 and first of all, I didn't say, for example, relinquish nanotechnology. I, I said we should relinquish the stuff that we judge to be too dangerous, and the we in that case would be, hopefully, the set of people who are doing the work, because I, only think, I don't think anyone else is capable necessarily from the outside, which means, for example, the biologists and the nanotechnologists taking responsibility, but you have to take responsibility in a non-naive way. I think we were all very, very naive about these things, say, you know, the kind of 9-10 kind of thinking was that no one would use biological weapons. Right. That, was, that was the standard answer to this, is that people just, it wasn't thinkable. An army would never do it because it might turn out and hit themselves. Well, that's, you know, a kind of a failure of imagination because there are uh, people who would use it who aren't armies, you know, like crazy people. Right. And right. so to, to go along So Osama and bin Laden, although he used old-fashioned technology, airplanes and jet fuel, in fact, gave great impetus to your argument and to your concerns. Well, we don't know who the person who did the anthrax letters right. is, but in, in fact, they're much more, much more concerned, I think, than Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is, is an outlier because he has lots of money, right. and he had a state base to do it from. The single, potentially single actor who did the anthrax uh, letters is probably much more like the thing in, in the future that we're going to face because, you know, it, it's someone coming out of nowhere, we have no intelligence about it, and it's very difficult okay. to catch. But now relinquish, you've got to explain this to me a little bit more because you say to me, sitting here in Silicon Valley, the people who are doing the technical work will be the ones who themselves decide to relinquish it. And I look up and down this valley, and there was a lot of money made in, during the boom, and no doubt, as the economy corrects itself, there will be, in other words, the financial incentives to pursue every possibility are enormous. Right. And so are you hoping to create not only good technologists, but saints? I don't, I mean, as a practical matter, how would you expect your regime to work, Bill? First of all, if, if work is defined as eliminate all risk, then it's, it's never going to work. Because we, well, what we can do is hope to bring risk and reward into a better balance. Um, somebody who's using a new technology in a way that has a catastrophic risk, but has no economic feedback in what they're doing to cause them to think about that, uh, is uh, proceeding essentially without without any, any, any input, any sanity. So somebody who, you know, uh, we, we went and genetically modified all the corn in the world. Um, and we said, for example, it would never affect the wild corn in Mexico. Well, it did. Well, that's, you know, that's so, happened now? Yeah, it's too, too bad. But no, there's no one to take responsibility. If there had been a catastrophe, 
um, who knows what would have happened. So the government. So who has, takes responsibility? The company that does it can just go bankrupt in our financial system if there's a big accident. And what ends up happening is we all get stuck with the collective cost of a cleanup. So, so what do you make of this? As a practical matter, his regime of relinquishment. I would agree with what I call fine-grained relinquishment. And I, I think that uh, it's a good idea to raise the uh, level of concern about these issues. Certainly 9-11 has shown that we have hundreds of vulnerabilities, which are quite mind-boggling. And these new technologies are far more powerful and will create far more danger. I do think we have to be very concerned about it. I think the answer is not broad relinquishment, but there are specific uh, developments that would be too dangerous that we should that we should not pursue. I think the answer is but, but a set of ethical standards of responsible practitioners. Established by whom? Well, I think it's a collaboration between the technologists and society. I, I, I mean, they say war is too important to lead to the generals. I think technology is too important to so just lead to the technologists. I think it's got to be a whole social uh, Like a discussion. professional board, like the American Medical Association, or do you want a... This is not a new idea. I mean, this, I mean, if you go into biotechnology today, there are very detailed ethical standards, and they're backed up by legal uh, regulation, which is quite active in the medical field. Okay. Uh, perhaps not as active in areas like corn, and, but... So, I mean, we do have to have regulation. We have to have ethical standards. We have to, ha I think, put a lot more effort into developing technological safeguards and immune systems and, counter and countervailing technology. That the, How problem, the problem we have is that the um, benefit flows to those who exploit the technologies and take the risks, and the uh, cost of uh, the cleanup and the defense largely is a, becomes a governmental function. So does Bill believe that government needs to control technology development, or are there other solutions? You read through the responses to your article, and what you get from a lot of quarters is, ultimately, he's calling for a coercion, meaning if people relinquish, it works fine. If they don't relinquish and somebody won't, then the government has to step in. So how do you respond to that? Well, I actually wrote an op-ed about a year and a half ago in the Post where I made some specific suggestions. I suggested that scientists uh, take a Hippocratic oath. Uh, that was suggested by Hans Bethe. I think that would be constructive. First, do no harm. Yeah, it's, it's part of developing a, a notion of res taking responsibility for consequences. Josh Lederberg, who spent a lot of time worrying about bioweapons, suggested that we bring back technology assessment as an as a intergovernment or intergovernmental function. So we think about some of these things a little more before we do them. I think that's a good step. But the, you know, there was a list of five things. I'm not going to do them all. But the third one was to say, um, if we, through a technology assessment, we, we discover that certain technologies are very dangerous, then we ought to try to provide economic feedback to those who would use it so they balance the risk and the reward. And one way you can do that is to force people to take catastrophic risk insurance. And if you can't get the catastrophic insurance, you don't use the technology. Today, something so, that's very risky but has no cost, no unit cost, is, looks very great because you're not actually, the company that's using that technology isn't paying for the risk. So you, can, you could apply, say, say, would this strike you as a, this may be a crude parallel, but the notion that one way of approaching the problem of pollution is to cause polluters to pay for it. So a factory that pollutes has to, you, you kind of... Well, right, you could change, you could change drug regulation instead of But regulating. that's a way of making the market right. respond look itself, at what right? We do, what we do today is we could have this very, very time-consuming procedure when we introduce new drugs. Instead, we could, we could um, make the companies that want to introduce them uh, pay, for, pay for the risk in some way. I do agree with, with Bill here that we have to put a much higher priority on, on being concerned about the, the dangers and risks. I think, I think they're manageable. We can take some comfort from how well we've managed a risk in Bill's own area, which is software viruses. Not that they're as dangerous as some of the other things we've been talking about, but the defenses have progressed along with the evolution of the offensive use of software viruses, and we've kept them relatively at bay. If we can do half as well in some of these other areas, that'll be beneficial. Bill, let me, last question for you. We've got Thomas Malthus arguing in the 18th century that population grows faster than food supply, so human populations are constantly going to be crashing through starvation. You've got the Club of Rome in the 1970s predicting that certain resources will become scarce. In fact, new technologies are developed, new deposits of oil and minerals are developed. All the prices of the commodities that they were worried about 20 and 30 years ago are lower today than they were then. So there seems to be this kind of a lure for the expert mind to predict catastrophe. And the question would be, that's a line of argument for poo-pooing you. How do you say, no, don't poo-poo me, this is different? What I'm really saying is that 
the technologies that are emerging um, are sufficiently powerful that they can be used to redesign ourselves in the world. And uh, I don't think there's much dispute about that, that using biotechnology, we can re-engineer our species if we so choose. Using nanotechnology, we can do all sorts of amazing new things if we so choose, and that uh, we will eventually be able to make intelligent machines. I think some people may argue about whether it's 30 years or 100 years, but those technologies are sufficiently powerful that we can reinvent the world and reinvent ourselves. And all I'm saying is that rather than letting whatever happens, happens, we ought to think about what kind of world we want to have. If we have the power to invent it, uh, we, ought to, we ought to take some time and have a discussion about what kind of world we want to have. And the f first part of that is to take uh, and have a discussion about how much risk we want to take, because these thing, technologies are very risky. They're, very, they're proponents, and, and no one really denies that anymore. Bill Joy, and Ray Kurzweil, thank you very much. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. Funding for this program was provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. This is PBS.